Uh, good morning again. Uh, we're going to get underway because we know it's a right. Here comes the man that we're waiting for, Mr. Simpson. Up front, Simpson. You're, we have your chair. Come on. We have your chair. Right over here. All right, so we're all set. Uh, there are some journalists who, uh, who said they are on the way, but we, we won't wait because we, we know that it's a tight schedule today. Um, so we're going to, of course, it will be, the, the whole thing will be um, recorded and posted to our YouTube pages later on. So those who don't, don't come on time or are not here will be able to make it. And we'll also, Simon will post it in his group. I will post it in my group as well. So it will be, um, it will be, get out there. And I say special good morning to all the journalists here. It might be a few, but we know it's at the only time of the year. We know what the traffic is out there, so therefore we, are, we say you could be anywhere else, but you're here with us, and we appreciate it. Um, Christmas, the fact is, Christmas is upon us. Whether you believe in it or not, it is here. You just want to walk anywhere and you see it. I uh, won't hold you up too long, so we'll jump straight into it, and uh, we're going to go straight to prior. Of course, we don't start anything here without prior. Uh, Tamisia Williams Gray will lead us in prayer this morning. Of course, anytime, anytime she does that, we have a good day. Tamisia, yeah, you can stay right there. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, not just football, but Jamaica, right? <laughs> All right. Um, at the head table, we have some esteemed gentlemen. Of course, at the end, we have Simon Preston, team media officer of the Reggae Boys. Beside him, Dennis Chong, El Senor Chong, general secretary of the uh, Jamaica Football Federation. Beside Mr. Chong, we have John Wall, uh, youth development officer. And he is also the assistant coach of the Reggae Boys. And beside him, right beside me here, is Mr. Roy Simpson, team's general manager. All right, so we're going to go straight into it. And um, yeah, last year was, uh, no, this year, I'm talking about, I'm talking in the past already. But this year, if you look at it, it was the most hectic year in international football for Jamaica. Overall, the most hectic year for football, generally, whether it be men or women or whatever you want to, it, it was. Um, a lot of stuff happened. So the general, general Secretary will look back at it and, um, you know, give us an idea as to how things went. Sir, your time. All right. Thank you, um, Earl. Morning, everyone. It's, it's up, it's there. Yeah, morning, everyone. All right, um, I just thought that it would be appropriate for us to meet this morning since it's coming to the end of the year. And, you know, we have during the year given updates as to what has happened. And we want to, towards the close of the year, you know, just give you a recap, a short recap, take any questions on what happened with 2023. And we're also going to tell you about what our activities are upcoming for 2024 because we've started the planning for them. Um, right now, also, we're on a sort of hiatus uh, because, as Earl said, it has been an extremely busy year. Um, in September, we had three games. In October, we had two games. And we had two games in November. And anyone who knows what it takes to plan a game knows that it takes a lot of time, um, effort, and resources because you're talking about moving over 30 people from all over the world and accommodating them. And then when you have a game in Jamaica, you're talking about the planning 
that has to go into the matches. So I'll first start by saying that we are grateful certainly for the activity that has happened. We're grateful also that we really have not had any incidents um, in in the year. Um, we had one or two um, hiccups when it relates to the visa process, but it really didn't um, cause any major dislocation. Um, the first one had to do with the UK incident where the staff was, was late in getting their visas um, because of the move of the processing from Jamaica to New York. And then we had the incident <coughs> with the um, U15s. U15s it was? Yeah. Going to Sweden. But outside of that, I think we've had a, a fairly successful year um, administratively. And when you think about the fact that we had so many events uh, during the year, it was really good um, you know, that we were able to manage through it. And therefore, my commendations to the staff, because I know the amount of work that they go through uh, <coughs> to put an event on or to, to mobilize a team, it is significant. Um, you know, I would have given you, for example, the, the, the amount of money that we spent on taking the women to the World Cup um, between November last year and the World Cup, it was about two million US dollars that was spent through the JFF, which is quite a bit of money. And um, we have to manage all of that. Um, so the other thing that initially was a challenge for us is the whole thing of the administration of the, the accounting, uh, because as you know, um, JFF has been under restricted funding for a while, but I'm happy to say that based on how we've closed out the year and our interactions with FIFA, who we had invited to come here in November, which was a great meeting we had, um, I think we're in a much better place. Um, we would have gotten during the year a tax compliance certificate, which many companies in Jamaica does not have one, and certainly the JFF has one, well, in excess of 10 years, there's never been one. Um, so we were pretty successful in that from an administrative point of view. And um, we have been managing very well um, in terms of internally, certainly better than last year in terms of you know, the demands mm -hmm. on the organization. Uh, so I think we've, 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 we've done a, a fairly decent job from that perspective. <coughs> um, 2023 was one of sort of bringing all the chips together ensuring that you know we, we have the right capacity in place um, you know ensuring that we were as productive as possible uh, given the circumstances uh, we also did a lot of work at the center and we were able um, based on the work that was done in the center to host some national teams there so the Trinidad team national men's team was there the Ghana national men's team was there and we were able to also rent out the facility um, so we will at some point in time ask the media to come and look at it it's now well well renovated everybody loves it we, a we actually have um, persons having a lot of interest in it right now we have a captain Andre Blake having a goalkeepers clinic up there which is going to be today and tomorrow and you know we've, we've been able to host several um, local clubs there also so we're doing a lot of work on that um, there's a lot of development work that's going to happen on that in the future um, but certainly from an internal point of view I think we've done well um, in terms of what we wanted to accomplish we, we, we haven't got everything that we wanted but I would say most things in terms of the administrative milestones we were able to achieve. And as I said, one of the big ones for us was getting a tax compliance certificate in place, which, as I said, you know, not many companies in Jamaica um, can boast that. Um, in addition to that, we also had a women's department set up, and we'll discuss more on that towards the latter part of the year, because 
one of the things that we believe in is local development uh, for the women's game and the men's game. And therefore, we've set up a women's department, which is headed by Margaret Sutherland. And you're going to see a lot more activity around that because we have a lot of plans that we're already putting in place um, for the, the development of women's football in Jamaica. Because certainly, uh, Jamaica has been very successful in women's football. Mm -hmm. We went to the World Cup and got to the round of 16. And um, we just recently completed the Gold Cup qualifiers. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to make it. But the girls who played did put up a very, very good performance. And that is something that everyone agrees with. So we think that looking at that, um, the, the amount of talent we were able to unearth for the women's Gold Cup qualifiers, it just shows the amount of talent that's available to Jamaica. You know, um, we currently know we have about 50 or more core set of players on the female side that we can call upon at any time. Um, and we're hoping that by the middle of, towards the end of this year, certainly, we'll have resolved the other issues that uh, have, have have plagued us with the the team or the or I should say the players who were at the World Cup. We want to resolve that issue and ensure that um, everyone is available. So we put a women's department in place. Um, we also had hired someone new um, in the the department for travel and projects, um, and he is here with us now, Stephen. And, you know, he has been doing a great job so far. But one of the things that we recognize is that we need to place a lot of emphasis on the management of the travel situation because it's our largest expenditure. And um, it's also a, a very, very time-consuming activity. So we actually have someone who's working very closely at, on that. And we are putting a lot of things in place for 2024 on that. So from an administrative point of view, we're good. Um, in terms of 2023, we had quite a number of successes in relation to the teams. And I'll ask Simon in a short while to address those things. But certainly, um, the under-17 tournament we're at um, for, the, for the, the boys was very good. The, we had the under-20 play also the women. Um, the under 14 women, the under 15 men, um, boys playing a tournament on the youth side. It was a very successful year for the youth component. And then we had the women World Cup, as I mentioned, and the women Gold Cup qualifiers. Certainly on the, on the Olympic qualifiers also, which we didn't make the Olympic qualifiers also, uh, but we did play in that. And we had the men doing very, very well, extremely well. Um, qualifying for the semi-finals of, for the Nation League the first time and, um, and also making it so we have a lot of things to look forward to for next year um, we had also a coaches, FIFA coaches program in Jamaica and a referees, FIFA referees program in Jamaica was hosted in Jamaica which shows the importance and the attractiveness of Jamaica um, for not just football, but also the administrative side of it. And coming out of the coaches um, program this year, we've had Mr. Rudolph Speed qualify as the first A license in the Caribbean, right, which is a significant accomplishment. Um, and this shows the emphasis that JFF has on development because development is not just about letting people play football. But we have to put the infrastructure in place. So we, we're doing the work on the center and developing that um, into a much more attractive um, facility with a lot more functionality because we're doing some work on the field also, which John can speak to. Um, but we now have a good cadre of coaches um, qualified, certainly at the, the B license stage and the C license stage and we're looking to move some over to the A license stage. I mean, that says a lot for us mm -hmm. because the more coaches that we can get at the, the A license stage and the B license is the better the capacity building that we can employ 
in the local leagues because local development is very, very important for us. And John will speak about the talent development scheme that we're also putting in place. And certainly on the referee side, um, we've done a lot in terms of the, the, the training for referees. There is constant training that's, that's going on. Um, we just recently had a ceremony to induct 50 new referees into the program. And we've had some of our referees certainly go away and do some international games. So that is what we have coming up. I mean, of course, you know that towards the end of the year, a lot has been um, said around the whole election process, which is not really us, but we still have to manage that. And that's coming up in January 2014. So I'd ask Simon to speak to the accomplishments, some of the signal accomplishments we've had in 2023 on the football side. Um, and what are some of the things we've achieved for the first time, historic achievements in 2023. Thank you very much, Mr. Chung. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. Just to touch briefly on those elements that Mr. Chung highlighted, we started the calendar year, I'll start with ladies first, started the calendar year ranked 44th in the world, now 37th, and that is our highest ever ranking for women. And we certainly hope to expand on that heading into the new year. And on the men's side of things, senior men, we started the calendar year 64th in the world, now ranked 55th. So both strides by national teams in this 12-month calendar. And the national teams that took the field this calendar year, strides have been made and improvements compared to previous participations in tournaments. We can start with our team, boys. First time getting and eventually finishing fourth. And this was the first time since 2013 even winning a game at a tournament. So our under-15 boys in the Dominican Republic making strides there. We can even look at our senior women as well that Mr. Chong touched on, finishing 13th in the world uh, and the World Cup itself. And the first Caribbean team in 85 years to actually go on to a round of 16 of a World Cup, which is truly remarkable as well, bearing in mind the Caribbean team that have been at a FIFA showpiece as well. Senior men been getting to a semi-finals of the Gold Cup for the first time in four years. That would have been 2019. And of course, for the first time in history as well, getting to the semi-finals of the Nations League. So all of this bodes well, leading for a busy 2024, which I'll speak on later on in the, the, the press conference. But I just wanted to highlight some of these elements and show that all of our national teams have made significant growth and sometimes for the first time achieving things like our under 20 girls defeating a Central American team for the first time since 2020. So we're very proud of all our national teams and we look forward to that further growth and progress leading into 2024. Yeah, so um, maybe Simon should just go into 2024. Yeah, let's continue. Yeah. So based on the, the schedule that we have for 22, pot potentially we're looking at a scenario where every month can be utilized in terms of activity. So I encourage you all to go on JFF Live on YouTube and watch the interview with Coach Hal Grimson, where he stressed on the importance of domestic camps into the new year. And he spoke about this will be a priority in that January, February time frame. Uh, but later on, John will mm -hmm. talk about the under-20s and the preparation as the CONCACAF under-20 championship qualifiers will take place. Jamaica's group will be in St. Kitts and Nevis in Basseterre, all games at the St. Kitts and Nevis Technical Center. We are in a group with Martinique, Grenada, and Bermuda. So we open the campaign on February 24 against Martinique, and then two days later oppose Grenada, and then on the 28th take on Bermuda. And it will only be the group winner that advances to the CONCACAF Under-20 Championship final round. CONCACAF in due course will announce the, the dates for, for the final round itself. March, that's when the senior men will be back in action. The CONCACAF Nations League finals in Arlington, Texas, Dallas to be specific. March 21, we take on the United States in the semifinals. And three days later, March 24, will be the final or third place playoff. So regardless of what happens in the semifinal, there will be another match. So at least two matches in that window will take center stage. And 2024 on the women's side of things, I might add as well, is an opportunity as well to get the pieces together for World Cup qualifiers because 2025 is the starting point for the women in relation to World Cup qualifiers for the 2027 tournament. So 2024 is a great opportunity with five FIFA windows for women to be utilized for friendly internationals or arrange tri-nation or quad nation series to be able to get match practice and sharpness ahead of the qualifiers. 
So the women will have international windows in April, May, November, and also December as well in terms of those international windows. October is also another window as well for the women to be active as well. And certainly work will be done to ensure that they will be active and also sharp ahead of the qualifiers that lie ahead come 2025. For the men as well, let me go into what June will be. And it will be, you could say, a double treat as the World Cup qualifiers take center stage. And that is in the window of June 3 to 11. And of course, the Copa America, June 20 to July 14. I know many persons have asked in relation to the World Cup qualifiers, in relation to the groups. So CONCACAF will reveal at the end of January a draw. They will have a draw in relation to the, the groups for the qualifiers and of course details in relation to who will be in Jamaica's group, what match will be home, what match will be away. So await the governing body in the region for further information there. And finally, the September, October, and November windows for men, that will be the restart of the next edition of the CONCACAF Nations League. So similar to 2023, the year we've had, 2024, we can look forward to another enticing and also comprehensive calendar year of international football as well. So we look forward to everybody singing from the same hymn sheet, media, staff, administration, as we're two wins away from a trophy. That is the CONCACAF Nations League. We commence World Cup qualifying. And of course, we'll be participating in one of the biggest international tournaments in the world in the Copa America. So we look forward to the support from everybody all across Jamaica and the diaspora as well, so that we can continue the strides and progress that lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Simon. Let, let me just add yeah. that on the women's side, um, certainly we were going to be putting some work into the Women's Premier League, the Tier 2, and the youth program, right, Margaret? Right, um, in terms of development. But one of the things we are looking at doing is having a four-nation tournament next summer in Jamaica. We're trying to work towards that for the women. Uh, so we're looking at those plans and seeing who we can bring um, and where it will be. Certainly for me, the city of Montego Bay is very attractive and we're hoping that um, St. Catherine Complex will be ready for then. Um, but that is one of the other plans we have. Um, and I know John wants to delve further into the yep. U20. I will ask Roy to also speak to the, on the main side also. All right, so uh, we can go straight to, to John. But before we even get there, a, a couple of things uh, stood out for me. Uh, congratulations are in order for Mr. Speed. Um, I remember when most coaches in Jamaica, even the head coach was a coach that was to walk around a whistle. Even the head coach in Jamaica was just walked around with a whistle uh, without much qualification. So therefore, we are talking about the head coach of the national team without much qualification. So now we have... Um, club coaches with an A license that is significant. Um, the 50 referees that, that, that came through the system significant as well, simply because over the years we have had we have seen a, a, a dwindling of the numbers when it comes to, to referees. Um, there were at one stage almost 500 referees, and then a couple of years ago there was about 280. So let's tell you. Uh, so now um, the the referees are, are, are going back up there again. And the third thing that Mr. Uh, Chung spoke about would have been the election. And I learned that some years ago here. Um, he said that we're not a part of it, yeah? Um, I was told that you are like a, a, a civil servant. You just be here, see what's going on. Um, if you're asked to do something, you do it, but you don't get involved because whoever wins, you have to turn up and work that's the Monday morning next after. I mean, when, when everybody gone at the weekend, um, you, you have to turn up uh, on Monday morning. Whether it be X or Y, you have to be there. All right, so let's get straight into it now, Mr. John Wall. Of course, we have the big the youth tournament coming up in February, Mr. Wall. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it's been a process um, ever since March on a monthly basis, two days a month, an exception for July and an exception for September, October, November, because then everyone kind of knows what Jamaica is all about. Uh, it's pretty hard to get access to the players. Uh, we had 
two days of training and one scrimmage against Portmore as of yesterday. I want to use the time to actually express my gratitude towards Portmore and the fact that they showed up and made it pretty interesting to review players. Sorry about that. And um, yeah, it's an interesting process of trying to mitigate and review as many players as possible meaning we're close to 70, I would say even 80 players reviewed so far uh, ever since March. And fair to say that's a pretty even number. Um, moving on, what we're looking at it is in January to play a double friendly where my intention is to utilize players from Jamaica and North America. And furthermore, heading into February prior to the qualifiers being on a camp playing and added two more friendlies that are of a higher or even more interesting level um, so we would be prepared for the qualifiers and that's meaning then you will be able to utilize more of a bigger pool of players so for me it's been a gradual thing trying to utilize as many people as possible and the fact that, speaking of that, is that we have assessed, we have reviewed, we have scouted, and actually done the due diligence prior to all of this. And I think, but yet again, I would need to stress, I am human, meaning eventually on the selection day, there will be one or two players that might have been there, and that's fine. But what I'm interested in is the long haul, how these players can become first team players for Jamaica. All right, sir. Um, so over the next couple of days, are you, is there a camp or is there anything happening with them within, on the 20s now? We, we're just in camp. OK, all right. Uh, so we go. We know how the, uh, the, 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 the day is for, for most people. So oh, by the way, um, we're not by bypassing your eye. If it's even to say hello, as, as Mr. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Roy, Roy, <laughs> Roy is the team's general manager. I think as someone has said that we had a very successful year last uh, this year. Uh, we look forward to 2024. It just shows what you know, is possible and uh, what we can achieve working together. I think in football we need to look at the three pillars, administrative, technical, and the political. And if we get three, those three pillars from the same foundation, I think, you know, we, we can create waves. We, I just came back from the Copa America draw, and they welcomed us, you know, they appreciate us qualifying and participating. It just shows how big a brand Jamaica is. We know how the football is, but but 2024, and as we look forward to United 2026, and the opportunity that we have to qualify for that World Cup, is just how, as a federation, as a country, and as we play football for the people, is how we get everybody on the same platform that we can all achieve our unified goals. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, before we get to question and answers, I, I've been in the football a long time, and I, I can recall when we used to get five love and four love and six love from teams in Central America and, um, and looking to get to the semifinals and even the final and winning the, the nation league would have been way in the back of your mind. You forget about that. I also remember when maybe one or two games were played in Jamaica per year as an international game. Um, there were years when no international games were, were played in Jamaica, and now we have multiple, multiple games being played over a short period. We have, I mean, this year probably about, I would say, at least 10, 12 games were played overall, so, um, and probably even more than that. So it's a significant shift from what um, used to to what we have now. All right, um, any questions from the, the media? Who, who is that? Roger. Oh, my good friend Roger, IFM. Yeah, good morning. Roger has studied. Um, I have a question for Mr. Chung and Mr. Wong. Uh, 
Stop, stop. Hold on, Roger. We, we're going to give you a mic because we have a, we're going to post this on, the, on YouTube so people can actually listen to the quality of the question and the quality of the answer, right? Yes, good morning again. Um, I have two questions, one for Mr. Chung and one for Mr. Wall. Uh, Mr. Wall, could you elaborate on how you got by finding players for this Honor 20 uh, process? I mean, what was the sitting out process like? How, how you come about identifying the players for the particular areas on the field and so on? And how far are you in terms of getting that team that will be participating in the CONCACAF tournaments? It's kind of a collaborative effort, uh, I would say. It's not just me alone. New benchmarks, if you look at it globally, is that I've used when in discussions with the technical committee and everyone, is that I've used Denmark and Uruguay as kind of a benchmark, pretty close in terms of the how size of the nation. Uh, Denmark's U21 had, and I'm taking two highest leagues that I'm coming to, has by October, 2023, 21,885 prof senior professional minutes. And a squad market value of 29 million euros. Uruguay, who won the U20 World Cup, 18,000 plus, and this is by October, and a squad value of 28 million euros. How close is Jamaica to that? On a global scale. Meaning, for me, I have to look at senior professional minutes first and looking domestically, it's a semi-professional league in JPL. So that's the closest we can get there. Globally, how close are the players to actually play senior professional football? The margin now, globally, is the players are getting younger and younger because they're better educated, they're kind of in a way pre-selected to. Domestically, you're looking at age groups that were probably the hit the most by COVID. Did not play too much at all. So it's been a race to the bottom, depletion of the pool domestically. That's my observation. But yet again, you have to look at where can we access the players. So I've been trying to look at senior professional minutes as a thing, invite, see them in our environment. Unfortunately, I cannot relate to schoolboy football, converting that to global football. I cannot. It's a different game. So for me, I have to look at how we can recreate it in our environment, and therefore trying to access it in all zones as possible. And that is done through scouts and others assess the players and so forth. Globally, we're already pretty much fully operative on people who are voluntarily scouting for us and looking and providing scout reports. So I'm pretty close to actually delivering the 60-man squad that will be the provincial list sent to CONCACAF. And from that point, that's going to be the player selected. Among that 60, you spoke about schoolboy football a while ago. Are there schoolboy, local schoolboy, schoolboy football? Oh, in that 60? we do love that thing, right? Because you like to blow their own trumpet. Yes, there will be some players, but there are more anomalies coming directly from schoolboy football. I'm sad, sorry to say that. Anomalies, you can... An anomaly is a player that potentially go from schoolboy football and directly into the international game. That's an anomaly. That's not your standard. Sad to say, but that's how far it's gone. You're looking at players who are training very short amount of time and have very few competitive months on the global scale. I'm just delivering facts. Sorry. It's not an opinion. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chung, of course, I mean, everybody have their opinions in regards to the reggae girls and the JFF, and um, we know that you had a meeting last week. 
prior to the meeting, there were some players coming out of the media again, having an issue. And uh, we all know that. Go. What, what, uh, what I would like to ask you, can you, you know, elaborate on how that meeting went with the, um, the players and the fifth pro representatives and uh, uh, what's the way forward now in terms of are everybody on the same page now and uh, what, what can you um, tell us about that? Yeah, well, we had a meeting on last Friday um, to discuss primarily the, the issue of payment because there was a statement made that no payments had still been made some persons which um we didn't support that and um we we know that we had sent off all the payments um to all the players and we sent the details to them on monday but we haven't heard back anything yet in terms of that and we haven't gotten any names as to who is it that would not have received it we're not saying that people might not have received it what we are saying is that we know that we have sent it off and um it left our bank account and we left our bank today the um, correspondent bank or the receiving bank. So if there's an issue with um, the bank who has received it and what has gone into the account, then we can assist with that in terms of providing the, the um, reference numbers for them to check back. But um, we haven't received any such requests yet from them. So we're aware that um, in terms of going forward, we are we were asked to have another meeting which we're, we're waiting on them to get back to us. We are willing to meet at any time, certainly this week. Um, we told them that if it doesn't happen this week, then I can't guarantee that it will be before the new year given the, um, the season and the fact that people have a lot of things to do. I know people are traveling, for example, from this weekend, uh, so it's difficult. So we're hoping that we'll have a meeting by the end of the week and and deal with any any other feedback. But certainly there's a lot of clarity provided to everything that was discussed. Um, and as I said, the main thing was the payment issue and we have um, confirmed that we have made all the payments that are, are due. Um, did you address why the girls were angry to the point that all of them who played in the World Cup made themselves unavailable for the Gold Cup qualifiers? Um, well, the, the, the letter that was sent initially did state it, you know. Um, it stated three reasons. Number one, the payment issue, um, which that was resolved um, with the assistance of FIFA who came in and said, hey, this is the balance of money. Number two was that the letter indicated that they wanted to, to be available. They wanted to, to have the name of the staffing, the technical staff, and also that they wanted to to speak about travel um, in terms of travel all of that is done according to contract and we have not gone below the contract in terms of the staffing you know what the response was that you know we, um, we we can't see the reason for you know having to to issue names before um, but we had indicated that all the staffing would be available yeah but in terms of them being angry to the point of not representing um, the country at this point, uh, have you guys dug deep and in, in looked into we that? We haven't got any, any feedback on that. Uh, we haven't got any feedback on that. I, 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 I just suspect that is the issues that were outlined. I mean, that was what was presented. So that's all we can go by. You know, we can't, can't go by anything more than that. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, let's All right, so I'll introduce yourself and your, and your, your, your media house. Sure. Good morning. Um, Ohega Blake, Dre Anywhere the Sports, based in South Florida, Palm Beach. I have a question, just one each, um, for the gentleman. Uh, and I'll begin with Coach Wall. Uh, Coach Wall, the you've outlined a very detailed process of recruitment. You've spoken about some stark realities in terms of your benchmarking. However, my part A, part B question is: one, 
we seem to have fallen into the same deja vu as the last under 20, where you had a game scheduled for the players who may be eligible based in the United Kingdom and Europe, and that fell through. I didn't hear in your plans. They were told that that game would be in possibly in the January window when you had it rescheduled. I don't hear that in your plans. If you could tell us about that, that's one. And secondly, we, we spoke about the scouting, etc., of local domestic players and those in, in North America who would be part of your friendly. I want to ask specifically the four that I know of eligible um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, players who do are in, would be in the Premier League first squads and the two that are starters in the championship. Have any direct contact been made with them? Have they accepted or rejected the Jamaica's offers? All right, we start with the Madrid. Uh, camp we're supposed to be. That I'm actually proud uh, that we, as JFF and me mainly, that we pulled out out of that, mainly because of the following reasons. One, there was a spike of the flu in Madrid. And you know what the flu is? Another word for that? COVID. Meaning there was depletion of squads, the opponents that we were supposed to play. Number two, we were not given the actual place where we're supposed to be at the La Liga complex in Madrid. We were supposed to be an hour and a half outside of Madrid. And with the uncertainty of opponents, I don't want to create a shit show. Meaning, I pulled out and the intention was to utilize the FIFA window. And best to my knowledge, uh, January is not a FIFA window, correct? Correct. Yes. To be fair. That's actually March 18th to the 26th. So what we will do and the intention is to start driving FIFA windows for younger national teams. There will not be always, but it will be at times. Meaning, the pushback on having Trinidad will be later on. Number two, because how sacred I value relationships with players, I will not use their names publicly. I will not talk if, no, or yes. Because also we have to lean on bureaucratic processes in terms of naturalization too. And number two, if they're already up in championship and playing, how eligible do you think they're going to be in playing a February qualifier on a non-FIFA date? So, um, th thank you, Coach Royal. Just to follow up, the, we understood the reasons why it didn't happen. We were just asking, really, the, what should I say, the replacement date. Uh, replacement for that, which you have said, would be in the international window. I just uh, We just asked because... Yep. Last year, we had a international outside of the FIFA window, a double header against Trinidad, in which you were able to call on some of the players who were in the UK who were playing for the under-20 squads. Correct. That, that is clear. I will, and secondly, we weren't asking for the exact names. If you notice, I stayed away from yeah, the names. I was just good, asking yeah. if the contact had been made and if any had responded positively. I would um, say that the context has been made, it's been a longer process, so I'm, I'm pleased with that and so forth. Uh, players who could be eligible of those outside our attendance is that they are Premier League 2 players, just though speaking of UK. In, uh, when it comes to North America, it's typical players that are in MLS 2, those kind of players that are available. and. We actually have a bigger dice partner when it comes to Germany, Belgium, and Holland, too. So we're trying to think globally. But at the same time, what I have to stress is that our players here that are good enough that we want to cater and propel and create a pathway for. So for me, it doesn't exclude anyone. For me, it's more about making sure that there's been a due process on everyone. 
the replacement when I'm talking about January. That is double friendly what we're looking for, based to be decided the exact week, to be fair. And February, the lead up to the tournament has to be utilized as the camp too. So I'm pleased with that and those kind of circumstances and those preconditions, I am. And quickly for the General Secretary, um, <coughs> well, those are two topics. The first would be the women's team. Can you explain to the public the exact way in which what exactly occurred that would have led to the overpayment mm -hmm. of a number of players from the women's football team, that being in the light of your very detailed explanation about the use of spreadsheets and calculations, how did that overpayment occur and what will be done to remedy or what remedy will be done with that overpayment? That's oh. the first question. You sound like you want us to ask back for the money. <laughs> I, I am, no, I'm asking you what the remedy is oh. if, in, in the public well, service. Well, there, was, there, there was a, there was a, there was a, a, an error in one of the formulas that caused it, um, and it was picked up. Um, so we know exactly what it was. There was an error in one of the formulas on the spreadsheet, right? Um, but that was just in relation to nine of them um, on one of the payments. Um, and then in terms of what we're going to do about it, um, you know, we, we, we're reconciling everything with them. We've sent the details to all of them. So we're reconciling everything and we will do what we need to do. You know, I don't think it's necessary for us to say that we're going to do X or Y on that. And, and, and the, I'll accept that answer. I'm sure our viewers would. Um, and the reason I said is not to, is not to put the JFF on the spot, it's just to assure ourselves that we won't have another fallout if um, a decision is made one way or the other. The other question relates to the electoral process, and I know you said that that is now out of your hands, yeah. but there are some matters that are in your hands, and I want to speak specifically to Pillar 3, and specifically to the Referees Association and the Intercollegiate. You had given a deadline of December 20th for the... The Constitution gave a deadline of December 20th. No, uh, I looked at the Constitution. I didn't see a December 20th deadline. No, it says one year from when the Constitution is adopted. Mm -hmm. It was adopted last year on December 20th. So one year from then is when? Okay. You got that? Right, December 20th. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you say, uh, how is it that our Congress, the final Congress prior to the voting, which would accept membership is on December 4, 16th, four days before the deadline, which would in fact, um, there be no board meeting, cause two of the bodies to not have their membership um, ratified, approved by the board and ratified, or recommended by the board, and ratified by the Congress. It's four days before the deadline. Thank you. No, I can't speak to that because if you read the Constitution also, you'll see that I don't set the Congress or board meeting. You are on the board, though. In no, a, in no, a, in no, a, no, no, no. In, sorry, in, in your executive capacity? Yes, I'm, in, I'm in, an invitee to the board. So yes. I'm invited to the board as an executive. But I'm not on the board. So if I'm, if you read the constitution, you read the constitution. Yes, I have. I have. Okay, what does it say about the setting of meetings? It's the, it's the responsibility of the board, the president of the board. Okay. Right. okay. And I'm asking, the president does receive legal advice, though. But if I'm, you sorry, if I'm, you not. Not, I'm asking if you or she breaches the constitution. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm not a lawyer. The, the, the question, Mr. Chang, not having, whose responsibility is this to advise the president? and the board if they are making a decision in terms of setting a date that would be in breach of the Constitution. I'll be very quick because I have one question for Mr. Preston. If they're in breach of the Constitution? Yes, if the decision that they're taking would lead to a breach of the Constitution. All right, so that is the responsibility of number one, um, anyone who they ask as a lawyer, right? Um, 
I would give advice on the constitution and the electoral committee also. Right, but 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 the setting of it is not anything outside of the the responsibility of the board. So I don't understand the question and I'm trying to understand how a setting of Congress is in breach of the Constitution. What is the Constitution requirement you talk about that's breached? No, I said the date that was set yes. is prior to the 20th, which would mean that bodies that did not host submission. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying application. To find out. So I'm trying to so find out. And I'm a little short with this because I think that some of the questions are not well thought out. Right? So I'm trying to ask, you know, what is a breach in that? That four days prior to the deadline set in yeah, the council. So what is a breach? I'll, I'll move on. Because I, I want to ask a question I don't want to engage in. No, man. I am asking you a question. No, what is a breach? Well, I'm not able to answer. I'm not, I'm, I'm so not how taking a breach. I'm question, asking. So how you ask me a question and you so, can't answer it? No, no. All right. Um, no. Uh, what we have to do is we have the next question. The pleasure to note it. Mr. President, you, you outlined the achievements of the various teams in the 2023. The and I acknowledge them and want to certainly congratulate the coaching staff, the technical staff, the technical committee, general team manager, uh, Mr. Simpson, who we beat a lot, but you, you certainly had, there's been improvements that we have seen and we must acknowledge where that is concerned and um, certainly improvements in travel arrangements, etc. However, I, I think it would be remiss if we didn't understand um, some of the failures that we've had, including the under-17, the non-qualification of the under-17 team, and what differently will be put in place to ensure that we don't have a recurrence of that. And I, I, we all saw what happened with the Gold Cup, we won't rehash that. But the under-17, certainly, what, what differently will be put in place? Um, and if I just highlight, for example, the timely naturalization of that question wouldn't be for Simon, though. Oh, it's because it's, it's he reported. Yeah, yeah, he reported, but that in terms of answering, that wouldn't be for Simon. You, 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 you want to take it, John, or...? Is failing to qualify every single time a failure? That means that media tend to create failure and win, uh, and success is just the two entities that exist. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to be Mr. Gray. I'm pragmatic. The, and looking forward, because we cannot change the past. Um, it would be interesting for Simon Preston to answer a very technical um, thing, even though Simon aspires to do everything. But in the capacity of media officer, it's not the right one. TDS. I can speak about the TDS, the talent development scheme. Whatever you face up here, it's kind of hard to change what's up here, right in front of your face. You have to do interventions earlier. And what we want to create with the talent development scheme is to actually start to hire more staff on a more full capacity, to have tournaments that lead up to the actual qualifiers, not the tournament alone, to actually globally prepare players what's out there. And I'm talking about girls and boys. The main target age groups for the TDS is 14 to 70. Those interventions will happen there. We're going to outline them. For us, it's about preparing it more on other bigger things. Take things on our shoulder. Educate players. Educate staff. That they're about the referees, the coaches. Everything is connected. We cannot single out a single thing. Then we're missing the whole point. It's not a single thing that's going to matter. It's the whole thing that matters. Meaning, I would say, I'm going to add political. I'm going to add another pillar, which is finance. Yeah. Fine, fine We're answer. talking about the pillars of the JFF. I'm going to add the fourth one, which is finance. Oh, yeah. So all of those things have to collaborate. Otherwise, you're not going to get the full thing. And I would love 
everyone is going to be here in the room when Jamaica can win the World Cup 2034. <laughs> what are you doing today f to prepare us for that? <laughs> no, you can hold that. Think about it for a while. It's more for you to look at yourself in the mirror in the night. <laughs> Secondly, me, I'm asking myself, what am I doing every day to make that happen for girls and the boys that will be part of that for the future? That's a simple thing, but so hard. It's a big question. Big question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, man. Garfield. Garfield Jones, TVJ Sports. Um, quick question for Coach Wall. Um, have you identified any talent in the just concluded schoolboy football season that you can? help to develop to be a part of the under-20 team? You can go a little bit late when I was on a, on a rant, but I can repeat the rant if you want to say sure. it. Okay. Globally, Denmark, pretty similar size country. U21s, 21,885 senior professional minutes. Squad value, 29 million euros. U21s, that's October. How do you convert schoolboy football to a global game? You don't really. You have to bring up a magic wand sometimes. It's not really in the context of the global game. That's the hard thing. Yes, there will be some players, but I'm not going to mention them by names. But senior professional minutes is a starting point. JPL is a semi-professional league to the point right now, but I would love it to become a full professional league. We have to strive and improve, but it's more what we can take in and try to recreate it and have more interventions like I did since March. And from that process, filtering it down to the final squad. So it's kind of a giving as many as we can, but elite, by the word, is not for everyone. It's not. It's a selected few. It is. So, send my answer to your question, but the best that I can give today. All right. Um, and that's how uh, qualified here for Scout Speaks. <laughs> All uh, right, so there you go. And uh, but before we go any further, just want to say congratulations, maximum to Marlo Sweetman, really girl, who is now a qualified UEFA scout. So she's able to just just the way that John spoke a while ago from the top, looking at the international means coming right down. She that's her job now. I mean, she 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 little by little she'll be able to uh, a scout and um, for whether the local or international teams. So, you know what I mean? When we have the, a woman, that's significant for, for, for Jamaica. Uh, a few years ago, we would never even think about that. And now we have one of them um, in our ranks. All right, um, we're not going to take you uh, any, any, any longer. We, we're going to break here. I uh, just want to say, Merry Krishna when it comes and a happy new year. And again, uh, it's 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 tough out on the road, so, Please need to stay safe and uh, stay safe while you're at home. And we hope to see you here in January. Good. Bye bye. Thank you.